Hey, Coach. Good morning. How are you? Actually, it's good afternoon, isn't it? Well, it's evening for us. We're in New York now. Oh, okay. It was like 5.30. Yeah, it's a nice sunny afternoon here in California. Probably about 75, 80 degrees. Great, great. It's getting cold over here, but we manage. We have to turn the heat on now. <laughs> it's good. Um, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, it's great that, you know, uh, I found out about you because while my, I was working with a, uh, with a family and then they, they have aspirations of, uh, you know, having their kid play division one baseball. Mm -hmm. So I think they were in a facility where some of your guys are doing the work and they noticed that, oh, they're doing the, the toll cor the toll curls. So yeah. then they're like, but the, the, the dad is also a follower of yours because he, he follow a lot of your material uh -huh. and he's like, Oh, you should, you should definitely reach out to, to coach Doug and, and talk about if, if this is a factor related, should, should discuss. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. So, so when did you get started to be interested in, in fascia? Probably about a year, year and a half ago. Oh, we okay. had one of our, one of my players was doing a lot of fascial work. Um, and had really gotten into it as his, as a uh, augmentation to his training. And when we teach eating, we talk a lot about being grounded and knowing that good athletes, no matter what the sport, really seem to have a good feeling for the ground. And whereas people think of that more as a terminology, we always see that these people are able to hold the ground, that you know, they're not going, and it could be mechanical where they, they want to shift off. Um, and it made a lot of sense. And we talked a little bit. And I also had a, a kinesiologist that works with me. And a couple of, most of my guys always have kind of a, if not a degree, are very interested in the uh, body side of things from a standpoint of most people have to have some responsibility to how they decide they're going to work out and, you know, strength and conditioning, whatever the case may be. Um, and it, it progressed. So one of the things we did immediately was the toe curl. Uh, very simple. And uh, we're able to watch, you know, our players, you know, all the way up and down. At first, we, it happened after spring training had started. So we had a lot of college players. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, just watching their transition and, and kind of getting their feedback. What was important to me is um, if we do this right, it connects us to the glute in a very direct fashion. And I think the glute is probably one of the most uh, least understood muscles from a standpoint of how people will talk about a glute. Oh, I've got my glute. And then you realize once you really find your glute, it's completely different than what people think it is. Yes. Um, and uh, we also were, uh, we're into a concentric knee centric training system using uh, the synapse CCR. Mm -hmm. And why it all tied together is because this device allowed us to put the glute med under an eccentric load. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, it's like your body goes, oh, wait, that muscle can do that. Um, and we find that's not only integral to, you know, athletic movement, but just balance as a whole. And I tell the story that after I, after we found our glute med, we kind of lit it up. Uh, even as I sit in this chair, my body will self-align itself to find the glute med because that's where the brain is most comfortable and knows that I'm really balanced. So then the next part came in when we just started thinking about how, you know, how it related to being able to basically train our lower half and our feet and the ground to tie directly into the glute. And without the fascial training, there is a breakdown. It's not as simple. And all of our guys are in the point where they can, maybe they start, maybe they feel the um, main stay of the work might be lower in the calf, you know, upper calf possibly. But we, we watch progressively over about a three to four week period is before long, as you're doing their toe, toe curls, they're now going right to the glutes. Yes. So, and what I think is that just means everything's working together now where 
I think normal strength conditioning, I think we lose the important part of having all the components of the body working together. That's right. my layman's idea as watching, but the uh, ability now to tie now the glutes to the ground and back and forth, I think is instrumental, particularly in any sport, but in baseball too, because it's not just the hitting, everything we do is ground generated. Uh, any throwing sport, it's basically ground generated. That's where a kinetic chain is. And, you know, it, it's interesting when you look at uh, athletes, um, I've got a major league baseball player who's a pretty phenomenal basketball player. He's also yes. a great bowler. He's just a really good athlete with great mobility. And we're talking about this and he took off his shoes and I said, you've got those feet. And he said, Oh, I thought those were basketball feet <laughs> because there's actually how the, how the it foot will start changing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I think if we look at it, we're trying to integrate it across the board for, you know, the amateur athletes, as well as the professional athletes. And, uh, you know, the more I delve into this and hear the feedback from my players, I think it's going to represent uh, kind of a change like a prehab on the health side of it. Mm -hmm. Because I think the more we get all that working together, I sense that there's the sheath will protect us too. Right? Yes. So we talked earlier because I've got a, one of my uh, players uh, hurt his hamstring. And we're seeing where that may or may not be coming something of kind of a chronic one time a year kind of injury. So I'm eager to institute the, you know, the toe curls and anything else we can devise in there, not only, you know, to strengthen the whole system, but also I think it's going to work to prevent future, you know, hamstring injuries. Would that be a correct assumption, you think? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is uh, exactly what we've been doing for the last, uh, I'll say, ten to ten years or so, because we started this work. Really, this is a this is a study of the Chinese martial arts called Tai Chi, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know, in that it talks about a very mysterious kind of strength called silk reeling strength. It's not a muscular strength because you know there is a traditional weightlifting in, in China in the in, yes. in, in, in the old days. So this got me really interested because at the time I was uh, I was experiencing some uh, like more or less chronic type of issues like the knee, and then when I was visiting the uh, the doctors over here, they said, "Oh, you got to strengthen your quad." So I strengthened my quad to astronomical levels, but the knee just not good it doesn't get better so then what i realized over time is that they talk about a particular uh training method that they're, they were doing with all the uh tai chi practitioner is number one grabbing the foot so the work actually why it took so long is to understand how exactly do you activate it how do you actually do it properly and that really took us a long time because we want to identify the exact mechanism inside the foot that's that's doing that that's can that can connect the foot better to the glutes and over you know 10 years of work we, since we work with you know different level of athlete from all the way from you know people who have chronic pain in the knee to you know division with some division one athlete and then later on to semi pros pros right we notice a very clear picture the elite athletes their fascial fitness is very high meaning the connect fascial connection from the feet to the glutes very very high but as you, lo you go down the level, each level, you will see that their fascial fitness is not so great. And they have, they have a harder time to develop this connection, right? So that was, that's what we started. But then over time, I mean, just this year, years alone, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's been incredible, Charlie. Just in this year alone, we discovered that the training that on fascia not only can help with people, of course, performing better because it, it links to the glutes. Like what you said there, the glutes was very mysterious, right? Like the muscle, why is it so mysterious? Well, it turns out in dissection, the glutes actually has 85% or more fascial inserts. Correct. Previously, what people did was they, they removed the fascia only to study the muscle because that's because their- 
understand the they didn't understand the form and function of the fascia. Exactly. They thought it was just a filler material and it was non-important. And this is also why they missed out a, a very big organ called the mesentery, which is like a, a piece of organ, a fascia tissue around the top of your intestines. Yeah. That has to communicate. That's a that's a conduit of communication between your gut and your brain and the rest of the body. And this is the same reason. And then they two years ago it was really established, okay, this is a new organ. We're discovering new organs now. Well, because they were throwing the tissues out. So if you're throwing the tissues out, whatever you come up with is going to be incomplete. Yeah. The formula is not going to be right. Right. The formula is not going to be right because you can't you can't create something whole with a, a omission on your part. Yeah. It's, uh, you're basically, you're trying to derive uh, observations or conclusions based upon partial information. Yes. And key puzzle pieces aren't in place. Exactly. So that's that's what's happening. And then we realize this this huge disconnect. And uh, and this is why a lot of the people who stuck uh, doing PTs were doing chirals nonstop because the muscle based exercises only will work on the muscle. If you have a muscle related injury, sure, you can do the muscle exercise. But a lot of times it's not just the muscle that's that's being injured. It's also your connected tissue. So if you try to use the muscle exercise on fascia, it doesn't understand. Yeah. So, so, so the way that we started to looking at this is, okay, number one, we, like what you said there, we, uh, we worked with a startup company at the time it was called Athos EMG. So they produce these type of suit that you can put on the body and then, and then measure the, the nerve impulse of your glutes. Because this is, this is a key because what do we realize in the beginning? A lot of people, they couldn't use their, just like what you observe, it's like they couldn't use their glutes. So there's no reading on that part. And then over time, you can see, oh, you know, through the, the, the toe, toe curls, through some of all of, uh, other, some of the exercises that we do that, that will tap into the, the mechanism, will start building that connection stronger and stronger. So that's what we have been seeing. And of course, like what you mentioned there, like for the, for the, chronic issue for the hamstring, definitely there are going to be significant differences. Well, we also look as well as are already, you know, the feedback we're getting for athletes is um, we had a player that had very weak ankles. They would roll very easily. I mean, yes. all the time. And we were doing, he was doing the, uh, the toe curls for about a month, maybe five weeks and doing it fairly. We, we tell them just do it every morning, three mm -hmm. minutes on each foot, no holding walls, just get in there. And I'll tell them that if you're having trouble with just one foot, while you're doing the toe curls on your left foot, go ahead and be curling your foot on the right, just, and try to kind of, you know, experiment what makes it work, but just stay with it. And he did. And he actually was on a field where he uh, stepped into a pot, like a gopher hole, a pothole. Right. And his whole ankle went again, but he was, he was absolutely hundred percent fine. He said, if that had happened before, he said, I would have been, uh, I would have been out for two weeks. Yeah. He said, if, if there was a little bit of soreness, but the ankle was stronger. Right. Uh, we had other players were talking that. Uh, so I, I like hearing about the knees because I've heard on our side too, where my knees feel better. And all of it sounds to me, as I said earlier, is that if we're firing all our muscles, we also have, you know, obviously uh, ligaments, tend, we have all these other things involved and we have our joints, but the sheath makes everything work better. That's yes. what I, I believe. One, two, three, four, rather than one, two, three, four. So I think by letting it work and excite the whole, you know, from the bottom up, it takes a lot of pressure off of like knees, probably elbows, and most likely, you know, ankles. And I'd be interested to see, you know, as we move up the torso, um, because like I said, it's, it, you know, we've been having a lot of fun with it and kind of developing some, uh, you know, little things to do just like isometric use of, you know, for the upper body, where we'll have somebody actually just reach out and I'm going to grip as hard as I can, and I'm going to turn this imaginary cylinder, and I can feel this 
moving all the way up my forearms into my, I can feel my traps and I'll get going so hard that my fingers will actually start twitching. But mm -hmm. after a minute or two, you know, you realize that you've gotten a pretty good movement and workout through, but it, it's not just like an, a forearm workout. It goes all the way through uh, most of the upper body. So it intrigues me that I'm a firm believer in, in order to do the things we need to do, it'd be better to be able to do things that work in synergy. So I can spend an hour working out or I can spend 10 minutes. But whatever time I spend, I want to make sure I'm getting what I can out of it. Um, and I remember when you talked about the, when you were training with, you know, and they're trying to strengthen your quad, uh, the inventor of the synapse is a tennis instructor. And the reason he developed it, because he'd watch his, you know, uh, some of the best in the world athletes go to work out and he'd say they can't make this move. So they'd go to their strength and conditioning person and say, well, I need to be stronger. And they would like make the quad and they'd say the same kind of thing you did. The quad is 30% stronger right now, but he'd go in there and say, it, it doesn't work. It's not making the move we needed to make because exactly. tennis players have to have a quick reverse. And that's when he uh, went into the eccentric training and, you know, started down that road. And I think that is a, you know, we've been just, you know, uh, excited about that because um, as I look at it, and again, particularly as a layman watching athletes at every level of the game perform, I started thinking about what we do conventionally from a standpoint of weight training in order trying to gain strength and I know there's a cosmetic idea for a lot of people to gain mass, mm -hmm. but ultimately to me, it's about being able to transfer ground energy. And we've known yes. that for years as a hitter, the good hitters are able to transfer ground energy. Um, but I also look at that I, it's, and I, I would say it's a bias now that I believe our conventional strength conditioning, particularly our, our lifting um, with mass and load is probably more of a detriment because I believe it has, it'll prematurely wear the joints. And we've talked to a lot of our players that did uh, traditional deadlifts and back squats, RDLs, moving mass weights. And one of the things we always talked about was in their, when they're in college, they would lift early in the morning yes. and they would lift four days a week. And they'd always complain and said, yeah, my back always hurt. I'd, I'd go out to the field at one o'clock, my back was still hurting. I'm right. like, if our back's hurting, there's something the matter. We're putting stress or strain on something that where maybe it's not the best idea. And I look over time, a lot of my professional athletes, the first thing to go are knees and backs. So I wonder if our ideas of trying to get stronger, maybe we're doing it wrong because of the eventual breakdown of things that don't come back. My muscles can regenerate for the most part. But once I blow up a joint, you know, it's, it's over. It's so that's where I, yeah. So I'm looking at the evolution and kind of the thought of how we, you know, take care of our bodies long-term too. And uh, so even for my major league players, I'm concerned because a lot of them will, you know, lift heavy, they're competitive. So if you're going to deadlift 500, I'm going to deadlift 550. So you keep pushing your body and then you don't feel psychologically that you're getting the work in if you're not really maxing out all the time. But I wonder if on the flip side of the balance scale that we're actually causing deteriorations, which are going to lead to, you know, basically inability for the body to perform the way that you would expect. And when that happens, we look a lot at, the, at compensations. If yes. there's an injury... Uh, you know, things go into guardian phase, we have compensations, and they usually don't work in our favor. And they put additional strains on the body. But nobody kind of weighs that out. So it's not going to be the most popular opinion. But I'd like no, to I see mean, you imagine you imagine the heat I get for talking about this, like we share very similar views, because this is exactly what we observed over time is that is that weight training cannot 
improve the type of performance that professional athletes are displaying. So we mm-hmm. started to look at, because we have people, I mean, myself, I already did 2.3x my body weight. No magic happened. However, yeah. when we started to switch to fascial training, I've been doing fascial training for 10 years now, but the stuff that the body integrates, it's just tremendous, tremendous. Yeah. So and I would like, say in a limited view, what we've done already, I would say that uh, everything that you've been able to already identify, we have already can validate that because we're seeing it too. Yeah. And it does feed my bias that um, I think it's like everything, whether it be academics or athletics, we have a, you know, we have belief systems and everybody does it, it becomes popular. But most certainly what I see is like in strength and conditioning, um, and we're used to this too, because uh, the, the concentric eccentric system, the synapse, uh, I, we're blown away by its, its ability and what it can do. Just blown away. We've actually have integrated some of the toe curl work into some of the lunge work as an advanced uh, method on it. Um, we've been actually playing with you know, how everything works together. But the problem is when I talk to strength conditioning people and I'm talking at the major league level, remember they've been doing Olympic lifts for a long time. Yes. And they've always felt that, hey, Olympic lifts will make you stronger. But there's also a point where I realize strength is by itself, is it a physical look? Is it because I can move more weight? But does that actually correspond directly to what I want in my performance for my particular sport? Um, And one thing I'm looking about, uh, good athletes. And obviously I work with a, a wide range of athletes, um, but should I be enhancing how we move athletically rather than just putting on the perception of strength through you know, uh, bigger muscles, uh, right. a bigger carriage? And I will share with you, I know some of uh, not so my athletes, but athletes close to my players on a, on big league teams. A lot of them were backing off because they felt they got too big. They were getting stronger, but they felt like their game was off a little bit. Yes, and they they've stepped it back down, and suddenly they've had a much better year. But there were a couple of years in there where it's like not very good. And I think the mentality across the board, at least probably in every sport is if I get stronger, I'll be better. But I said, okay, but what do we need to be stronger in? And, um, and how does that work? Sometimes maybe it's just durability. Uh, but trying to isolate, there's a certain point where it's a law of diminishing return. You know, once you get to a certain point, adding more bulk doesn't necessarily mean better performance. It could work against you. But like I said, it's been somewhat slow for us to uh and again we're not considered obviously a resource when it comes to strength and conditioning but we've been around this field for years because all of our athletes have always sought out you know uh strength and conditioning people and there's been uh people i've been introduced or i've i've learned about and i've studied and i've been um less than like i didn't buy in you know, there are just things they're doing, which because strength conditioning goes through its fads, too. And I think to be able to take the whole body now and kind of and, and I hate to use the word holistic, but that's where it works the best, that there's a lot of things we can do more naturally that I think will bring us to the point where we're getting the performance we needed. Rather than maybe there's an offset when we're you know, lifting heavy or trying to do a lot of, you know, what I would call conventional training. Um, and although it's moving kind of slowly, uh, the way I can, the way a lot of my players take it is today, you know, people talk about a baseball player being a geriatric at 32 years old, which is not true. A lot has to do with the body, the genetics, how they take care of their body, what they're doing. All those things do matter. But we do see the uh, irreversible consequences of injury, um, whether it be you know like a chronic injury or you know even a debilitating injury. But looking at doing things a little bit differently, 
and saying we've we've all got like 100,000 knee bands underweight. So when you get to 100,000, now you know you're just you know going to tear up the joint. I'm just using that as kind of a what I tell people. So if you've done 100,000 deadlifts since you were 17 years old. Now, every deadlift you do after that, it's just wearing down your knee joints. Your knee joint can't rebuild. It's not going to make knee joints stronger. It might make your body seem stronger, but the, the, the weakness is at the joint. And in, invariably, when you watch players fail at any sport, it's, joint, it's never muscular in nature. It's always joint in nature. At least that's been my take. With, and most certainly, probably the biggest thing we look at is knees. When the knees go, things don't work as well. When the knees are sore, things don't work as well. And then we go up into the lower back and we've already talked about that compression on the lower back. Right. Um, and I know a lot of athletes in their uh, later years, you know, they, they don't move as well, you know? But yeah. like I said, and of course you could get into elbows and shoulders as well. But yeah, I'm excited to, th this direction is, is at, very exciting. Yeah. Um, so let me let me break down because you mentioned a lot of good points there. The, the 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 joint problem, the knee and lower back and the elbow and shoulder, right? So it turns out, so the fascia is the protective sheath. There's a multiple layer of fascia. There's actually three layers of the fascia that's a, that have been identified. And each layer of these fascia plays significant role in terms of suspending the weight from the joints and provide lubricants. So if you are able to connect from the feet to the glutes better, not only you are actually elevating the heel from the ground, so the person is not so heavy footed, right? But you're also taking a weight from the joints. So this is the people think, think okay, fascia, you know, is just that uh, almost like uh, it doesn't, it cannot be seen. Like you can't see, oh, if your fascia is good or this person has fascia, everyone has fascia. But to evaluate how good and responsive the person's fascia is, is by evaluating the connection from the feet to the glutes and to the core. Now, the, the other, other point that you mentioned, which is very fascinating, like we already know what the benefit of that is, is when, you are, when you're doing this and cranking, right? Why do you need to put in tension in the fingers? Because when you're doing this, this type of fat is called fascial tensioning. Yeah. The fascial tensioning, we already know what happens when you do fascial tensioning in the cellular level because it changes the cell. Normally, the cell of the fascia, it's fibroblast. You can actually change the fibroblast to another type of cell called the myofibroblast. Now, this type of cell is twice as strong as before, and this cell actually can contract by itself, just like muscle does. So the difference between the 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 the, the regular people and the elite athletes is not in the muscle from what we found out is not in the muscle but it's, it's on it's on the it's on the cellular level of the fascia because you have a fascia driven guy which is the elite level type of person where they use they, they, they perform everything effortlessly where you have the the lower spectrum of athlete they always struggle it's a very effort uh intense they have to grind Right. So this is this is very fascinating because the hands, right, you produce these type of myofibroblast cells. Now, the myofibroblast cell has a holistic range of functions. It has anti-inflammatory um, anti <coughs> um, chemicals that it secretes that help the body will repair. Also, it helps remodel the, the, the fascia. And it has a holistic range of other type of functions that the body needs to achieve but in the in a matter of weeks and months so this is like a precursor cell for a lot of holistic range of body functions so when we work with people right with chronic pain the reason that they're get, getting better is not because uh you know the the muscle gets better it's really the body produces this type of, this type of cells and start to rebuild the body rebuild the fascial system holistically now the fascia can reach everywhere in the body the brain has the fascia, meninges, come down the spine all the way to the coccyx area of the, which is the pelvic floor, the tailbone area. So your whole body is full of fascia connection. 
And what we, we were what we were looking at before is that with conventional weightlifting is that we are training people to be segmentally strong. Because anybody, if you give them weights, they can hit a certain number. But that does not equate equate to elite performance because yeah. the elite performance also has another factor in there which in which their fascial connection and the myofibroblast cells are much higher so so this is where that missing link is so we find it very fascinating because when we first looking at this thing really in the beginning was to, to address you know the, the knee pains and and the uh, the performance but what, over time we realized you know what the person gets to be more glutes dominant by building the connection from the feet to the glutes. Now, once he did that, he was at a very different level of performance. So that that was that was the the really interesting part. Well, we look at also when you bring that up to me when the body's working that way, and you know it's basically enhancing the way it works that's also got to have a better effect mentally and emotionally on the system. Because when things are the matter, it has a, a negative impact I would describe, you know, meant psychologically. So I would bet that there's probably a benefit over time within a few weeks that if somebody's been able to like change and start basically a process of what I would describe as regeneration, that would probably have a, a much better outcome and and how they just perceive everything because yes. i mean the the body's a, a big unit i mean it's a it's a totally complicated complex system which we still don't know everything we need to know but it, it seems to me that all these things kind of fit together and i'm i'm that person that doesn't believe in coincidences i believe things come to you you know you know as you as you're open to them and uh, no, I'm excited to, to delve into this and, and try to direct my athletes because, and it's not just the athletes. I think, you know, generally speaking for health, uh, yes. these things could be positives, but it's, it's funny to see that, you know, I mean, you put, you know, 12 years of work into this. So the research is out there, but you know, I'm sorry to hear that you're, but not surprised that you're getting, you know, uh, lashback from the traditional uh, strength and conditioning field, shall we say? Yes. Yes. Has I that, mean, this, now, over the last couple of years, is that getting a little bit better, or do you still feel you're running into walls? So my story is this, right? So I've been working with, uh, you know, lower level athletes or people who want to go to Division One athlete for a while, and then from there. I really built up my resume, sort of. And then I, I got very lucky to work with a, a young Chinese fighter. Her name is Zhang Wei Li. And we, at the time when I was working with her, she was ranked number five. So we worked three months prior to the championship fight. She had it. And she knocked out the first guy in 42 seconds. Ouch. Yeah. So from there, basically, my work kind of kind of validated got got a little bit more positive uh attention and uh and we i mean we that that's how it started to get better and then of course there's some you know business side of things i have to change for for myself and my organization right to make people more uh make lame really making layman's to understand what is fascia what is fascia because yeah. you google this term before i mean maybe even five years ago you're not going to find any websites or things the literature on it but really because recently there was a lot of money being put into the fascia just especially in germany there's a, a organization called the fascia research society which is I'm, I'm a member of and i'll be doing a webinar with dr robert schneib soon who is the one of the founders of the the organization and uh, a lot of research have been coming out of basically explaining what the fascia tissue is, what are we seeing in elite athletes' performance? Is that the muscle that's actually propelling the person or is that the fascia tissue, right? There's a lot of things that are coming out gradually over time. And now we not only we have a good understanding of the fundamental blocks of fascia, 
and how it integrates with muscle, we understand you know it's 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 uh, benefit on injury prevention, force production, um, in terms of healing the body holistically, is it, um, connecting the body, and the the work that I am really uh, dive you know dive into is the connection from the feet to the glutes. Because this part is very, very important because re just recently there was researchers done. They observed the hidden neural channels in the glutes that can be innervated. Before there was, there was people just throw that gar thing in the garbage. Yeah. Now <laughs> people start to realize, oh, wow. So the fascia here can be innervated. So where do you do it? Is it coincidence that your feet, the biggest component of your feet is called plantar fascia? Right. Not plantar muscle, it's plantar fascia. So there is, there is a huge link from the, from the fascia underneath the foot going up your holistic chain to the glutes. So this is something that I think we, we uh, you know, in your experience, in my experience, we see a lot in the elite performers is that they are very good glutes dominant and fascial driven movers. So if you try to have a, a lower athlete to replicate their movement, they cannot do it. Because no, not the until, right, not until, just, you, not until you make the internal workings connect better. Because the outside, you can mimic that movement, right? You can, everybody can, can mimic a, a basketball shot, but that ball is not necessarily gonna go in the same way the professional athlete is gonna make it. Agreed. Well, we look at the, since our ability now to, um, basically we talk about activate the glute med or basically make the brain aware of it. Um, and we take athletes, we take older, anybody comes in, we're going to light that glute up because I'll tell people that you're, you've never felt that in your life. I've had some of your biggest, strongest people get in there and, you know, these are guys that, you know, deadlift, they're used all this and we'll get them on and we'll fire the glute med you know, we'll fire decentrically and, you know, they'll get done. You know, this takes all of about a minute and they'll say, man, I've never felt that before. And they start, you know, they're like, wow. And I'd ask them, okay, in all the days you've done all this glute work, have you ever felt that? And they're like, no, never felt like that ever. I said, well, now your brain understands what that muscle is capable of doing. It didn't know. I said, it's when I take an athlete and put them in a position that they may not be used to. And you know, neurology aside, we'll sit there and say, okay, you need to do this. And they'll sit there and they, their body freezes because they don't know how to make that move. It's, yes. you know, I guess the closest analogy is trying to ride a bike. But when they can make that move, the brain, okay, that's how that works. But sometimes for us, I have to fight the neurology of bad training prior. Um, let's say for a hitter, you know, bad ideas about hitting, bad, you know, training instruction, that now we're overcoming a body issue and also a movement issue, which is basically the training of how to deliver the swing or even throwing. Because we look at all aspects of, you know, you know, athleticism. I look at other athletes too in other sports because those movements are going to translate to what we do in the game of baseball. Um, well, importantly, it all kind of translates also to life. But once you, like I said, that, that whole glute thing, um, the inventor and I have I've talked that I think that what people find is that that glute mead uh, is probably the biggest proprioceptor for balance because, you know, everybody talks about the ankles and the, the neck and the fluid in the ears. But I'm telling you, when that glute mead fires, the brain is in a really good place. It knows, wow, for that to happen, I am good. Because we're constantly looking at um, the relationship of balance to vision. Um, because if a hitter's head is moving, we know that the body's counterbalancing. and there's lots of other things happening because the body is responding to the brain's corrections because it doesn't want to fall over. And when we're able to take that out and have an athlete move clean and clear, it's not only that they just, the vision just, they, they have so much information that can come in. Um, so we tie that all into what we call 
you know, want a better term, glute stability, <laughs> you know, because if everything is moving right, the bottom half's carrying the top half, you know, it's just a cleaner move. And you go back into like martial arts and realize how important that base is. Um, the, uh, and it's funny because you figure maybe for many, many thousand years, people have known kind of the importance of how things worked in the body. Maybe not the, you know, that the fibroblasts were becoming myofibroblasts, but the movements were there, particularly like I said, when we think about some of the uh, ancient martial arts and training. Right. Um, but again, the biggest thing I see now is uh, I think strength and conditioning went through a phase or goes through these phases of fads where something comes out and people don't like it or it gets downplayed or it probably is no good, whatever the case may be. So you have this cycle where everybody says the only thing that's hold true is lifting weights. Whereas I think that maybe I'd like to see that change. I have a young son too, and I don't want him, I don't want him, you know, moving too much mass or load. Right. I think the long-term deterioration is there. And if we can find better ways to strengthen the body, and more importantly, it's when we talk about ground force and being able to generate power is usually people don't realize I can have the biggest biceps possible, but that doesn't mean I use the ground. And exactly. when I can use the ground in my whole body now is working to move something, you know, it's amazing that people realize like, wow, why'd they move? Because the whole body's working. Now I'm able to harness the entire energy of the, from the ground up my whole body to do something, which obviously seems healthier, but it kind of goes against what everybody, you know, visually thinks about strength. And yes. I've always seen players that um, are wiry, maybe not as, as bulky. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's not the genetic. I'm not saying everybody has to be, you know, a, um, a mesomorph or an ectomorph, but being able to realize that power is based on within the whole body system rather than maybe what my upper body does, maybe my torso, maybe how I, you know, move. Um, that's why I think the continuum is, uh, doesn't surprise me that better athletes already have inherently figured out that they have a better use of the lower half. Right. It's nature, right? So the answer lies in the nature. I mean, there's, there's a very good reason why a lot of these athletes, not just baseball, but a lot of other like football or soccer or basketball, uh, boxing, a lot of these famous athletes, they came from very poor childhood. So they were not able to afford the shoe. Now, what that does to the foot over time is basically what you're doing here. You're, you're creating a lot of fascial tensioning in the foot. And like what, what you said before, the example you gave of the person stepping in the hole and then they mm -hmm. twisted a little bit, it was nothing. We actually identified a mechanism, what we coined it as a hyperarch mechanism. This mechanism actually stabilizes your ankle naturally. So there's no way you can, you can through fascia, of course. Yeah no way you can twist your ankle. So it, your ankle is actually stabilized, just like your wrist, right? Your, your wrist has the function. Yeah. If you're gripping here, your wrist is essentially locked with, with your arm. Your ankle actually does the same thing. But this is not something that medical, ministry medical people talk about it. I don't know why, but they don't talk about this. But there is a mechanism actually stabilizes. So what we do is we actually use this mechanism as a way to train the body, as a way to initiate that natural ability that you have to build up that function to the glutes. And what we realize over time is that, um, do you know a coach named uh, Mike Hall? Uh, also a baseball coach. He's not from here, but he's from the UK. No, he's a, not, don't know. So very interestingly, because this person, this, this coach, he... Uh, He's also a baseball coach. So what they're doing there is they, he studied this, uh, uh, this phenomena called the critical flicker frequency. So it's how much your visual cortex can process information. So let's say if baseball flies in, right? Now if regular people, like regular people have a 60, uh, probably 60 FPS, like you can recognize your, when the TV flickers around 60 Hertz, you can yeah. see it's a continuous, right? But they are, they are people and there are animals out there 
So for example, the fly, the reason you can't swap the fly is because the, your motion of fast for them is slow because their, their CFF, which is the critical flicker frequency is very high. They're like yeah. 140. So what happened is that if you're, imagine if the baseball, right, coming to you at a very slow pace or slower pace, now does that increase the chance of hitting it? The answer absolutely. is yes, absolutely, right? So what this uh, coach did was he did a lot of Tai Chi. He realized a lot of Tai Chi movement. Well, he doesn't know about the fascia part yet, but he did yeah. a lot of Tai Chi. And he realized that Tai Chi, by going slow, it actually makes the person having a better CFF number. So I then in, in return, they can actually hit the ball more accurate, accurately and, and forcefully. So it, well, it's, it's a very it's, fascinating study. It, again, what we look at is also as we've been able to do here, which people have said you can't do that. But if we're able to get ourselves in a, in a really good headspace, when I talk, if the brain is balanced, we can process a lot of information. We may not have time to formulate a thought, but our ability to see is tremendous. When the brain is kind of out of balance, it's, you know, it's firing muscles. And I talk about people all the time that if I turn my head a little bit and I start firing muscles all the way down on my calf, my, my Achilles, I said, now my brain's worried about firing my muscles one way where I'm trying to use my muscles to do something else, but the brain doesn't care about that. So by able to like, you know, use glutes or anything else to keep the, the head very steady, it allows us to see things. And I can tell you that my hitters can actually see the fingers on the ball as it's, as it's being released. They can actually, they can't sit there and go, oh, fingers the side of the ball, it's a slider. No, but they see it. They're able to process that where the brain is able to react um, in, in a kind of a predictable fashion. Um, but at the very least, they're able to see movement right at release, which is about 25 milliseconds. But we tie that into just reflex actions and realize that although we may not be able to formulate thought because we're looking in milliseconds, we are able to create information. And, you know, that at the time the batter hits something, he will realize he saw the fingers on the ball after the fact but it, it's able to give them an idea of predictability of what the ball will do. And the other thing is you look at if we're moving better, it does slow, it's, it slows everything down. So even if someone is throwing 95 miles an hour, that can slow down if you're moving right. But the problem is when you speed up, because most people have the adverse opinion, which if he's throwing harder, I need to swing harder, I need to go harder, which actually works against us. Because then we grind rather than, you know, create the, you know, learn to, you know, stay smooth, stay slow, because then acceleration is easy, uh, easier from the standpoint of the, of the movement. But that doesn't surprise me at all, because so many things I feel, you know, what separates a, an elite athlete from a good athlete from a non-athlete. Um, and I've looked at amateurs and watching how children develop. And you realize that a lot of times I think maybe the good athletes really have a better movement capacity, whereas the non-athlete, it hurts them to move. They can't move as well because you know, they're constricted or restricted in some way, or they're uncomfortable. So moving like that isn't something they want to do you know you get some kids that just zoom they're take off they're going to do everything and then you get the child that's more sedentary but then you try to wonder is is that just a response to like the how the body felt we're talking about the people with you know that have chronic pain well that's going to reduce them at what they're trying to move and you know basically uh i feel that over the development stage is watching now, can you take a non-athlete early age and put them in a better place physically because wear and tear, I think the, the athlete, athletic movements of the body, I think is healthier. But, you know, and everybody says, well, they're not an athlete, but what does that mean? 
Okay, maybe they don't have, you know, the genes or whatever the case, but it's still about, can they move better? And if I move better, maybe I'm healthier. Yeah, that's so something. Goes that, yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, that's something that, that we had a lot of experience in the beginning of this work is because we work with a lot of teenagers because that's that's when you know when we started doing this is like okay you go to the doctor you go to the sports med they can't help you with the knee you're asked to wear the brace right but the problem is there so then of course you can't you can't shoot well you can't run well right because every time you do a like for example you, you do a baseball uh, you, you do your runs you're hurt, you play a game and you're hurt for two days. Yeah. So, so that, that's not good. That's not never going to get you to division one because you're, you're stopping yourself. It's not your opponent stopping you, it's you're stopping yourself, right? So we're trying to help these people to, to increase that fascial connection to the glutes, to the core, so that they don't experience that the same episode of pain. Now, when they don't have that, of course, they, there's performance aspect of things increase as well. So the first and most important thing is getting rid of the, the pain. Yeah. Yeah. How was your success with the uh, athletes? Um, and again, obviously, lots of individuals, some, some respond differently than others. But overall, if you're kind of encapsulated, I would be surprised if there wasn't a, a, a tremendous amount of success once you get everybody working, that there's definitely uh notable progress yes so well one one kid that i work with that was a local to our area in new jersey the name is mark dedica made it to division one basketball i mean the, the he went to a lot of scouts in the beginning because he, he he had chronic knee pains so he was no name there was no name of him and then he started going to this showcase after his knee recovered right and then, of course, he started to move really well, started to make some shots, and he started to play the position he was good in. He, he actually grew very fast. He grew from 6'2 to 6'4, from 6'4 to 6'8. And so during this period of time, he was doing this, this work with me. And so what we found out is, wow, what, what a big change he can make. So the, the, the scouting report, not from me, but from the, from the camp was like, this kid came from nowhere. I, this was the exact same type of commentary I got when our UFC athlete became the champion. It was like, where, where did she come from? Like, no, how did, how did, how did you, where, where did she come from? It's like a big jump. So that's what we, we have been seeing is that if the person put in the work, put in the correct amount of work, and you, because a lot of these fascial connection, from what I realized that you have to use your mind. So there's a meditative state of this fascial connection and building this fascial connection. Now, the people who, let's say when they're younger, they wear the sh overprotective shoes or insoles, they tend to develop a very poor foundation from an early age. So it's very difficult or harder to change as they age. Understood. Yeah. But it's not that they can't, it's just going to be a, a more difficult road. Yes, because I, I work with some some people from the UK and uh, from age six to 13, they were basically playing no sports or playing video games. Now, the fascial response from the feet to the glutes, you, will, you can imagine how poor it is. I mean, the, the glutes will look fine. The muscle will look fine, but it's the it's neurological, like right? It's yeah. the neurological connection in the fascia layer. It's not there. So I go back to, um, I, I was looking up researches that can back up to what I'm saying, right? I actually found the one, which is in the, um, this person, this is, there was two doctors. Um, they did a study on cats, on kitten, kitten's eyesight. So it's the same thing, right? So it's a neurological stimulation during developmental stages. What they found out is that they, the cat, if you just suture one of the eyes shot, right? And then you let the other, the, both are healthy eyes. Yeah. But if you just suture one shot, so no light signal can reach the retina and stimulate the brain. After a while, they unsuture the, the, the eye, 
they measure the they use a cathode in um, surgery. They actually uh, put a uh, receiver into the brain of the cat to measure if the cat if the eye is actually functional or not. They found out that the eye, the healthy eye, become non-functional. So what they realize that there is a developmental necessity to stimulate the nerve in order for this neurological connection to form. So it's actually a same case here because nature works in similar ways. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about the foot, it's a sensory organ because of the plantar fascia, because of fascia, right? And you let it, you don't exercise it. You don't stimulate it. You put protect, overprotect the shoes. Over time, when the person develops, they're going to develop differently because the, the, the neurological signal from the foot to the rest of the body are completely different, dormant. And this is why a lot of people have dormant glutes in, in today's society. Like the, uh, my, my glutes are soft, can't move. But I bet if you touch the division one athlete or professional athlete, you touch their glutes, they're rock solid. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the biggest difference. How do you go from, so my, my thing is, how do you go from soft to solid state? Now, because the fascia is a liquid, it's a non-Newtonian fluid, right? It can it behaves very differently than than water, for example, because water you 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 splash on it, you hit a hard, you hit it hard, it will splash, right? So non-Newtonian fluid is sort of like the starch water, like you mix starch and water together, yeah. And then you hammer, you use a hammer on the starch water, it actually stiffen and become hard. So that's what fascia is doing. In a lot of cases, in the responsive, um, you know, athlete, like the high level performance athlete, that's what the fascia does. And this quality has been exploited by martial arts for certain centuries, because of course, if somebody tries to hit you, right, they try to hit you. you, you want your core, your abs, your glutes, every part of your body, you want to solidify. You don't want yeah. your, you don't want the punch to, to punch through you and hurt your organs. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this was a very big deal, especially in the, the arts I'm talking about, you know, Tai Chi. So, so all this start to, to make sense. But what is crazy this year, what we found out is that there was a very, um, a very prevalent type of injury in the spinal cord called aricoid adhesion, which means that the, the person received epidural shots. So they deliver, deliver babies, they receive an epidural needle into their spine. That spine can puncture the, the arachnoid layer of the fascia. So in response, the fascia will get inflamed and start to tangle up. And when that happens <laughs> over time, <laughs> excuse me, without intervention, causes chronic pain. But this year I was very lucky because in b before we, th we, th we thought about our methodology is, is should be able to influence all layer of fascia, not just the glutes part, because fascia is, is holistic. It has no beginning, it has no end. So every part can be influenced. Eight weeks later, the person reported no pain for the first time in six years. So it's, it's a very big deal for us. And 12 weeks okay. later, there was no pain. So that yeah. condition just reversed itself. So we know now for a fact, we have a study case that the fascial training that we're doing can influence the deepest layer of the fascia, which is sitting inside the, the, the arachnoid of the spine. The, um, now, when it was able, was it able to untangle the fascia yes. or reform it? It's, it's really untangle and remodel it because the myofibroblast cell has the ability to help restructuring the, the, the fascia. I don't know if you guys, you've seen this video called Strolling Under the Skin. <laughs> that video really mm -hmm. shows, like, I, I don't know if you've seen it. I will write it down and be sure to look for it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And what does that tell us? It actually shows you what, what the, um, the fascia look like when it's live. So it's, it has very nice structures and it has spacing, proper spacing. And we also know from people who to take the <coughs> radiology scan of the knee, when the knee become chronically, you know, uh, inflamed, the fascia tissue is curvy. So there is no 
no tension, no straightness to it, to it. It's actually curvy. Basically, they are, you know, just like the net behind you, right? Yeah. It, it, it has slack. So if we're able, so what, what, what we found out is over time, if you're able to strengthen this fascial connection from the feet to the glutes, you get rid of the slack, you actually create that tension. Now you have a net that has a lot of tension. Now a little bit of vibration can generate a lot of power. Yes. Like people, people always think that, okay, the only way you, you, you increase strength is by making the muscle bigger, but the muscle actually develops on fascia. So if the fascia, right, here's the, here's the kicker, is that if you can strengthen the, the fascia, you actually <laughs> increase its vibrational frequency. Now, a little bit of muscular tension will help generate a lot of power. Yeah, it's, it's almost like magnified. Yes. So that, that's what we're going, going well, that's, that's where what we have been doing is number one, creating this connection. Of course, let's say your glutes is 85% fascial inserts. Now only 2% is innervated. How can you be powerful? You cannot. So the first step is really to increase this connection to the most capacity that you can possibly can for that person. Then you can do exercises to enhance the ability for that person to use the glutes and core together. So now you can help the person and give the you know, really putting them in a better position to succeed in whatever they're doing. Well, like I said, overall, I mean, we work with athletes, but I look at just, I think the overall uh, quality of life would be, could be dramatically impacted in a positive way if we, if things were a little bit, what I would describe, more mainstream. Yeah, it's not, unfortunately. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to help it go mainstream by working with the Fascia Research Society. Because, because I feel like, okay, if I don't do this, because there's a bigger issue at play here. A lot of people have MCL surgeries or ACL surgeries, right? Yeah. What's happening right now is that they have to go to PT. Now the PTs are not trained in the fascia at all. So they will tell you to do the same, which is what I experienced, strengthen the quad. Now, if a knee pain cannot even be fixed by strengthening the quad, how is that gonna help with the ACL? It's gonna be very poor. And this is, this is also correlating to the stats where if you suffer, if a kid suffer from the first ACL surgery, within nine months, there is like twice as likelihood of re-injuring again. Yeah, because, I've heard, yeah. Because is, that, that, is it a function of how it was the therapy and the rejuvenation after the surgery? Well, because well, the fascial connection really didn't re improve because the, right, the exercise there- they, they missed that important cog in the wheel right there. Exactly. So, so this is around it was actually created probably more because they didn't take care of the of the fascia, strengthening everything around it probably put more pressure on it rather than support. Right. I mean, I mean, there's going to be more research, I'm sure, that's going to going to say otherwise because right now there's I see a big problem with this is that number one, very little people know about fascia, very little, even in the doctors. And the treatment methods are limited to the muscular side. So when that happens, you're going to have a lot of people stuck in chronic cycle, meaning I, I did my PT once, twice, three times. I still get the same problem over, over, over. Now, that's not the best way forward because you're missing no. out the, the entire component. Something's not working for a reason. Exactly. So my hope is that by working with the Fascia Research Society, by by making this work known to more people that they're going to start a cascading effect of change because i mean i don't want to leave the way i when i was experiencing the same problem 10 years ago that was a big problem and that was so mentally draining that i second guess my natural ability you know a lot of things confidence a lot of other things right my ability to enjoy sports that's the most important thing for me. But, you know, by understanding where the root cause is instead of just addressing the symptom, you can do a lot of things. Well, I see it in a lot of, a lot of times people look at the problem, but they're actually looking at the symptom, you know, rather than the actual problem, what is the actual cause and effect. Um, but I think a lot of times everything's also I think some of the PT people are a little bit worried to do something outside of the, the box 
because <laughs> yeah but the reality being that you know they have this kind of this recipe do this 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 and this and let's see how it goes and that's why i'll see players that are in rehab some are responding and some aren't responding as fast and it seems like because everybody is worried about causing more damage or, oh, my God, I did this rather than this. And now all the people that say, well, you never do that. That's what caused this. So it kind of limits the ability to kind of get out of that box to start saying, hey, let's go into this. Let's let's look at some, you know, let's look at the fascia. Um, I think it should be mainstream in the PT world pretty quickly because the one thing a lot of the PT people I've dealt with, they're concerned about, you know, the good ones are concerned about the health and well-being and their recuperative nature of, you know, their clients. And if you can find something that can show them, I find that they seem to be a little bit more willing to go beyond to, or at least they seem to be that way, that if you can find something that you can show them, it seems like they would be on board probably faster than what I would call on the strength and conditioning side. But you yeah. still see a little bit of, re do you see resistance from the PT side of things? Some people, you know how some people are there because in their <clears throat> entire life, they're trained in their craft yeah. with, with one philosophy, right? It's very hard to say, okay, what I learned, it might be incomplete. What I learned might be missing an important component. But I mean, if you, if from a, from a bystander who, who didn't <laughs> go through the same type of, uh, I'll say, education, you can look at this from a more objective point of view. Oh, you didn't care about fascia, you threw it in garbage. That's yeah. what happened, right? So the work that, that I have and with the Fascia Research Society is really to raise, raise this awareness that fascia actually can do more. And, and we cannot just keep on pouring, you know, enormous amount of resources into the muscle side of things but you got to look at also the fascia side of things and so far i've been getting very very good results with fascia because we started with muscle as well right so we did that we did that 2.x body weight we did that yeah. like we made the body incredibly strong in terms of muscular strength but that doesn't solve the the, the missing piece of athleticism and that's more than just the muscle it has a lot to do with the the connected tissue, the fascia, and how in neurologic, the core connection from the from the bottom of the foot all the way up to the brain. So, yeah, it, it all depends on the person. Yeah, and like I said, I think it's really difficult for anybody in a field of study um, and a, a committed field of study, I should say, will feel a sense of ownership and. You know, you don't want to, nobody wants to find out they're wrong about anything. I mean, it's just not a good feeling for, you know, the human nature. But I like to say that, you know, as medicine, as research, everything around progresses, we know a lot more now than we did 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, you just look at uh, Western medicine in the last hundred years. There's stuff they did 50 years ago, which, you know, you shake your head at, but it was growing. So you have to look at today's professional and tell him like, hey, we're still growing, right? But people get caught in here because I think it's kind of a safety valve right. or, you know, that worked for 80% or something, whatever number you want to come up with. But in every field we're into, we have to keep pushing beyond. And we have to admit that, you know, no one knows, no one has all the answers, but, right. you know, I'm, I'm excited, you know, yeah. the, uh, because I think it's, it's, and the thing I've seen is it's not something that, you know, obviously we've been limited to just basically some little things, but it's not a burdensome kind of a movement. It's not going to take hours a day. It's not going to put you in excruciating pain. Um, it's not going to cause you to require, you know, a long recovery. Um, and I guess what I'm thinking is just, it's more about consistency. Yes. Consistency and buy-in. You have to know what you're doing. What is the reason for doing this? 
right? A lot of people, they don't understand. They, they think, oh, it's just a small thing. Maybe it doesn't do much, but we measured it. It does do a lot in the course of weeks and, and, and 12 weeks, we, we know what it can do. Well, the other thing is 12 weeks in an athlete's life is not a long period of time. We talk about, I was just talking to someone earlier about, you know, dedicated work like in like eight weeks. That's, it takes eight weeks to have, you know, some sort of transformation. It takes time. So many people work a few days and if they're not getting the result they want, it's like, it's not working. There's a consistency, but if you're doing something that you can do simply, that's not, like I said, I mean, you don't have to go to a gym. You don't have to, uh, I mean, it, uh, even if they stay with something as simple as toe curling, it's something you can do easily at home. And, you know, over time, like I said, we're able to see uh, uh, interesting correlations, cosmetics. Um, a lot of our players started showing, we call the split calf. Yes, the double calf yeah. formation. That's what we've seen. Yes, and they're looking at that saying like, people have spent like, years in the gym trying to get that right and literally we had one guy we actually took a picture of it that you know three three weeks in and another one uh this is a high level athlete right three weeks in that's pretty short actually actually an amateur i'm not sure you know a college player so but again you know it obviously had been training everything else but the the change was noticeable um if you're into the cosmetics, but we realize it's happening because all that's a reason, you know? And so I, I was theorizing in my head that if you, you should activate the fascia before you work out, <laughs> you should active, you know, just activate it and increase its ability to do whatever magic it can do because it's real, you know? Yeah. Now, obviously, you know, I'm just a hitting coach. Right. But part of my job is looking at the, you know, the welfare of my players and also being able to understand, you know, all the other things that are around that player, particularly as it relates to their performance. And that most important thing is, you know, the you know, training regimen, rehab and prehab, um, you know, strength. Uh, and I, and it, it's over the years, this, you know, I've been able to kind of see that there's a little bit of a drop off. And when you work with, you know, all the strength conditioning, people have their ideas. Not all of them are coalesce into a, you know, they have their fights in between and this is how this done and this is bad. You know, they, they start, you know, pointing at each other. Right. Uh, and I guess whether it just be human nature or just like we talked about a field of study, and a confirmation bias is that this is what I believe, this is what I, that there's nothing outside there. Um, I think you've got to look outside a little bit, but no, I'm excited. I, and obviously our conversation today really energizes me, you know, I, I appreciate that. What direction would you, would, what, what other directions would you send me in to learn? Uh, so, so after this call, we can, you know, definitely collaborate more. Um, I mean, okay. we, I have, uh, we have developing, uh, been developing a holistic range of exercises that betters the fascial connection, which we call the hyperarch fascial training. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we use this for all type of athletes and people who have chronic pain have been reacting a lot of benefits with this. This is why we decided to go forward with the fascial research society and doing the webinar together. So I will say attend that webinar and get like a more holistic view of the of the fascia, you know, because the Dr. Robert Schneim is going to be there and he's going to talk about the fundamental research up to the most recent research about fascia. And I'm going to fit in that. I'm going to try to fill in the piece on the application side because a lot of researchers are not on the clinical side. So they don't work with athletes. They don't know, oh, the, the mental cues you have is off or, oh, you're using the wrong, wrong part, right? The form is off. They don't understand that. So me, I'm more on the hands-on type of coach. We work with athletes directly, all type of athletes. So they're like more from the cellular level, what they're seeing, yeah. what are the functions. So yeah, definitely attend that. I'm going to post that. I'm going to send you the link once we okay. have everything um, ready and we can start from there. I appreciate that. I look forward to it.
Great. Thank you for your time. I mean, it, it took longer. I mean, it was, it was booked for an hour, but now it's like an hour 47. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't uh, cut into your Sunday evening too deep. No, no, no. It's a uh, pleasure is all mine. So really glad that we connected. I think there's a lot of, a lot of things that we share in common. And uh, definitely I'm looking to collaborate even more. I, look, I appreciate that, John. Well, uh, yeah, keep me in the loop. Let me know. And let's go from there. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.